Um, so yeah, as Rosie was saying, I'm gonna go through, through uh, Stage in Urban Landscapes, which is the book I published with Burke Hauser a few years ago now. Uh, it's amazing how quickly time goes. Um, and yes, please, it'd be great to have a dialogue at the end of this and a conversation around it. So I'd like to start really by showing you where in the world I came from before this book emerged, because I think it's important to understand the context of how I was seeing this book. So that red dot there is me in the middle of rural uh, Colorado in the States, very arid landscape. This was my hometown. You can see the, the built up uh, urban context on the left and my house is over somewhere in the, in the national forest on the right there. And my house is here in the bottom left. Hope you can see my cursor. My closest neighbor was a mile away. And you might be asking, so why is this important uh, for a conversation around urban landscapes? And I think the reason really that's, that I find it particularly intriguing is I had no real appreciation of what open space, public open space, public shared space was about. And I moved to London in 2003 and I was cycling through London. I was basically going through, through and across this space every day. It's uh, outside the National Theatre. It's in front of the Dennis Lasden building. It's been recently refurbished by Gross Max. And it, it was a real eye-opener for me as someone who, was, who had just studied landscape architecture about the simplicity of the design and the fact that there was a whole host of uh, events and entertainment and staging of different uh, configurations that was bringing this, life to, this, this space to life. And I was also seeing the way in which urban spaces, particularly in London where there's a, a deficiency of green space, how they were changing and contracting and, and expanding with the daily flows uh, of the day. So this is obviously at lunch in a very small space, just north of Oxford Circus. Uh, but it's amazing when you have spaces like this in London, the way in which they change throughout the day and the way in which they really respond uh, to, to the demands of people coming out at lunch. Also simple spaces like this in the South Bank, the arena uh, to built in the 80s and how on any given day it might look like a fairly abandoned, empty platform, but it is brought to life with community events, you can bring in sand, you can do more formalized things and it, and it really transforms uh, the space. But what's interesting about this is it does feel like it has a container. There's a clear form, there's a scale of a type of event. And in a way, I think it prompts some of that interaction to take place. The other thing is things like this underneath uh, Waterloo Bridge, the book fair that happens, which really is, is it was an experiment and it's now become real, a real destination, both for us as, as people that live in London, but also people that are traveling and visiting for the first time might come and find out about this extraordinary moment of transforming uh, under infrastructure spaces that are often leftover spaces as they were. And similar, this is in lower Manhattan, but I was really taken, I walked past the street on the way to work one day and it looked like the image on the left, fairly banal, uninspiring, typical sidewalk that you might see in New York. And I came back in the afternoon and it looked like this. And it was this idea that through the chain, through the, the selling of plants, the commerce that happens, that that act of installation, that act of uh, bringing produce, as it were, and, and selling plants had a transformational effect, both for me as I walked through the space, but also in the space itself. So I, I started to really look into this and understand, you know, how, how is this such a key component for us as, a, as one of the repertoires of the design industry? And how can we begin to think more confidently about the way in which we can design for these spaces to be curated? And this is an image of the Agora, and I would say it's the quintessential notion of what it means to come into a public space, to share democracy, to share uh, the day-to-day -day quotidian rhythms of buying and selling goods. You might, might be a place that would, in modern times, you might discuss uh, your favorite Netflix series. It was that kind of a space where everything came together. <clears throat> and as a result of that, the public space was naturally activated. Through the natural process of people coming and going, there was a sense of energy, a sense of of curation and activation taking place. And you can see that also in some of the medieval uh, hill hillside towns in Italy. This is uh, Piazza del Campo in Siena, which even to today, it still hosts the Palio. So it's a space, an extraordinary space on the day today. So that the importance that there's this everyday quality to a space, but also its ability to expand to host a cultural event like the Palio that's been going for hundreds of years now. I came across this diagram that Jan Gale published and what it's illustrating is the, the left-hand side of the image, they call this the whale diagram. The left-hand side of the image, which is uh, the blue band in the center, is or are those activities that would happen on any given day regardless of the quality of the public realm. So that's things like going and buying your food, it's things like doing your errands, picking up your dry cleaning, in this instance, you know, your, your boots and your candlesticks. And that will happen regardless of what's going on in the public realm. On the far end, on the right, where it says passive and active, 
those are those those great moments where the the design and the quality of the public realm is of a quality that it encourages people to dwell, to stop, to engage with their with their friends and family, to sit in that space and take it in. And that I think is really what we're after as designers of public realms is how do we get people to really engage with the space, enjoy it and dwell in it. And he was making this point that with the arrival of the car, we had to work extra hard in order to make those spaces a reality because we can no longer rely on the day-to-day -day rhythms of the city because all of us are driving around in our own little worlds driving around on our car, listening to our own music with comfort, control. So in order to pull people into public space, we need to create something that's particularly interesting. The other fundamental uh, piece of research is the social life of small urban spaces by William H. White. And this was a, a very uh, empirical observation driven bit of research about how people use space. And he really focused on Seagram's Plaza. If you're not familiar with this book and the movie, I really encourage you to go and watch it. It's an, it's an extraordinary piece of uh, just very, very basic, very common sense observation of how people use space, but it's so fundamental to what we do that it really should be the bedrock for every design decision that we make. But he was effectively looking at the way in which people use space, how the movement of the sun changes how they occupy a space, if there's flexible furniture, how they might begin to use that. Uh, and it really became an important tool for understanding that when people have some control over their space, they often become more successful. And the idea of bistro movable uh, tables and chairs is a really strong example of that. There, there's also been a couple of key moments in the realm of architecture. So it's nice to, to borrow the architectural airwaves here tonight to, as a landscape architect. But it's important to understand that there were these moments in architecture and the trajectory of the architecture discipline that really began to think about carving out space Speaking of design through the lens of program, uh, this is the original, one of the original design drawings for the Pompidou Center by Rogers and, uh, uh, and his partner. And the important thing here was that half of this site that Renzo Piano and, and Richard Rogers designed, they gave over to public space, to the part of this as it was called then. And this was a dense built up part of Paris. And if you were to look at this purely from a land value point of view, you should build that whole site. The whole thing should be building. But what's really successful about the Pompidou Center now is that open space that you see, the way in which it gauges with the building, that it's effectively open-ended. There's not a lot of fixed program about it, but it's flexible, it's usable, it's a, it's a stage of experimentation. And had that been missed and it was just a building, you would have lost a lot of the day-to-day the -day life, those incidental encounters that happen as a result of those events and festivities that happen in this space. The other key moment that certainly design schools in the US that are teaching landscape architects point to is Parc de la Villette, uh, which was won by Bernard Schumann. But this diagram here is by OMA Rimkhaus, um, which was really the first time where there was a conversation around program in the sense of what landscape, the activation uh, elements moving through the landscape became a type of program in the same way that they would have talked about a building. And you can see some of the layering of the diagrams at the bottom. But this quote I thought was really interesting, nature, whether the thematic discovery gardens or real nature will also be treated as program. Blocks or screens of trees in the various gardens will act like different planes of the stage set. They will convey the illusion of different landscapes of depth without offering in passing the substance. So I went back, I was prompted to kind of go back and think about my own uh, education in landscape architecture and what was the zeitgeist, what were the design uh, the leading designers doing at that time. And a lot of this was coming off the, the end of the landscape as art, as art movement uh, that was happening, really led by the work of Peter Walker, which you can see in the image here, Martha Schwartz, George Hargraves to some degree, which was really uh, a preoccupation with the idea of the aesthetics of space, the notion that what we put out in the landscape is really a fixed composition. It's something that you, first and foremost, you view, you see it as a piece of art, and then you occupy it. And these were some of the, the leading figures in the field that were, that were designing at that time. Very much, very strong, bold geometry, strong graphics, things as, uh, as fantastic as gold-laden frogs that are cast into this water feature uh, by Martha Schwartz. And it really prompted me to think, what, what is missing compared to what we are designing today? And really, it's, it's the reality that uh, people are creative beings. We have this amazing, uh, desire to occupy a space in our own way. 
to reappropriate open space in a particular way, uh, to find our own place in that field of uh, urban spaces that we can really make our own. And I remember as a student waiting for people to get out of a place that I was photographing so that I could take a picture of the composition, that it was about how forms and shapes came together. And so we've come a long way, I would have thought, in the last two decades. So really what I'm presenting here, is it's a young discipline, it's a young part of what we do as, as our designers, architects, landscape architects, to conceive of how people might use the space, to see that what the space does is as important, if not more important, than its form and what it looks like. So from this research, what's, what's become very evident is around the mid to late 1990s, there was a real shift, both in practice, but also in academia and in, in, uh, in theoretical discourse around what landscape architecture was doing at the time. And one of the, the fundamental shifts and stepping off points for this idea of flexibility and activation was this work by uh, West Eight in Rotterdam called Sherbetlein, or City Stage for us that, that don't speak Dutch, um, which was really celebrating first and foremost this idea of the void and that void being this nondescript, indeterminate, uh, open-ended stage onto which life could unfold. People could be flexible, people could be creative in that space. Uh, it, could hold, it could host formal events and installations, but it could also be just a space that people occupy and appropriate in their own way. And so these are some of the, uh, uh, the diagrams in the book, and each case study is, is trying to deconstruct those spaces to understand what are the component parts that make it work, what are the component parts that make it successful, and the elusive sense of what is the scale of that space. And I'll come on to talk about scale later. But what's important, I think, about this space is they, they were leaving it, the, the open center area is left open. That's the open, flexible stage. But there was a huge amount of focus on the edge condition. And this is something young Gale talks about in the sense that we need to have our back protected. And it's something that goes back to uh, this idea that you're protecting yourself from saber-toothed tigers looking out across the vast plain. That we feel safe and secure when our back is, is against something secure and we can look out across an open space. So there was a lot of emphasis here on, on the edge condition, but importantly, the central space was used and planned in a way that it could begin to take things like this. And it was done through using these animated crane lights that originally were operated by coin. You put a coin in and you could operate these huge 15 meter tall crane lights. And what it did is it transformed people walking through the space into performers. This is obviously very much a stage performance, but also the way in which the light was landing as a spotlight it created that sense of, of being a performer. And it also then became a stage for different configurations, different overlays, different staging of, of devices, different ways in which you could engage with a population. And that's the important thing nowadays that we see in every scheme. It's about how do you, how can you push, push, push footfall into your spaces? How can you generate more interest? The power of social media is undeniable now in that sense, as far as people are looking for that next thing that gives them a competitive edge. And that very much was, was started to be experimented with in, uh, in City Stage in Rotterdam. Another key moment, so that, that's 1996. This is also around the same time in 1999. This was a competition that Stan Allen uh, was beginning to develop for a competition in Barcelona. And you can find it in, in his uh, publication, Points and Lines. But he was looking really at this idea of indeterminacy and what's how much design is enough? How much design do you need to really give a sense of, uh, of establishing a place and giving people a sense that they can engage with the place? And he puts it this way. Uh, I've got to minimize my screen here. Let's just see. There we go. Uh, infrastructures are flexible and anticipatory. They work with time and are open to change. By specifying what must be fixed and what is subject to change, they can be precise and indeterminate at the same time. They work through management and cultivation, changing slowly to adjust to shifting conditions. They do not progress towards a predetermined state as with master planning strategies, but are always evolving within a loose envelope of constraints. So this alongside with what we just looked at from West A was this notion of effectively not putting too much structure and fixity into a space that it begins to predetermine how people use it, but more allowing life to unfold in a way that it start, you start to come up with things that you maybe wouldn't have thought of initially in the design. 
And around the same time, James Corner from James Corner Field Operations, now everyone will largely know his work from the High Line, uh, he, he published this piece, Recovering Landscapes. And in that, it was the emergence of landscape urbanism. And there was, a, there was this discussion and the conversation, the discourse was around what a space does. Again, what a space does is as important, if not more so, about the physical form. And this was the first time really where we're starting to think about landscape as a productive entity, both ecologically, systematically, but also culturally as, as people flow through a space. Within that book, Alex Wall wrote this essay called, um, uh, wrote, wrote this essay and, and his quote here is, here the term landscape no longer refers to prospects of pastoral innocence, but rather invokes the functioning matrix of connective tissue that organizes not only objects and spaces, but also the dynamic processes and events that move through them. So he's very much in line with the same conversation as, as uh, Stan Allen. The grafting of new instruments and equipment onto strategically staged surfaces allow for a transformation of the ground plane into a living, connected tissue between increasingly disparate fragments and unforeseen programs. So this was a key moment where we're stepping off of the landscape as art movement, composition, the organization of space in a fixed form and beginning to think about indeterminacy, open-endedness, flexibility, program activation, etc. So what I'd like to do is just go through these four, uh, these four kind of key headings here to, to hopefully stir a conversation at the end. The first, for hopefully there's people here from London, but hopefully there's people also that aren't that can see some of the work that's been happening in the capital. Uh, and then we'll go through the, the rise of the installation, I believe that this is the same space. So this is just pre-2000, when it was still a car park for the Inland Revenue Service. And as we know it today, it hosts a series of fixed events, things like the Film 4 Summer Screen, it hosts skates, it hosts the, the Summer Series concerts and shows. Um, and it also hosts a kind of a day-to-day -day art culture. There's an extraordinary um, team behind Somerset House and behind the courtyard that bring public art into public space. But the, the important thing also here is the ability to create a very grand and comfortable space in the day to day. And a lot of that's driven by the fountains that are there. When the fountains are on and people are coming out of the cafe, it's almost all you need for that space to really function. And with a flick of a switch, the fountains can be turned off and you have this, this stage and this big platform to which you can host these events. Another example is Trafalgar Square. And we only have to go back to 2003 to think that this was actually still a gyratory where cars were going around and severing uh, the National Gallery from Trafalgar Square. So you can see the image on the left, the image on the right, and how that's changing. There's quite an interesting moment here, which I've learned also after publishing this book, is that Trafalgar Square itself, which you can see in these images and how it's programmed and used in that way, is governed by the GLA. So they oversee the operations and the management of that space, which is why you never see any busking going on here. You don't see um, people play music and be paid for or floating Yodas and things like that. Whereas this space, shown an image on the right where you can see the buskers, is managed and operated by Westminster. So there's these invisible power struggles or these invisible lines of management that govern what happens in a public space that I find deeply fascinating. Um, so again, the diagram begins to explode how Trafalgar Square works. The key thing also is the idea of the fourth plinth that um, I'll come to talk about, but decided that there was an open platform that could change again over time. So the space is changing through its use, but you also have this fixed entity where artists can begin to experiment and engage. And I would argue one of the most successful was Anthony Gormley's uh, One Another, which is uh, the guy with the giant balloon head. And what I think was really powerful about that was it was a constant change. There was a constant uh, evolution of the installation as a different person stood on the plinth every hour throughout the day. But also there was a different kind of engagement that you got from that where people could engage with the, the person as, as the piece of art where the others were static objects. So there's something about the interactivity of installations that's fundamentally important to what they were beginning to see more and more in public spaces. Another fundamental that's really started to, to be made visible in the public realm is the use of water. Water as an element that activates that day to day, but also has the ability and the flexibility to transform the space. So this is the V&A uh, Courtyard Museum designed by Kim Wilkie. And what's interesting also about this particular image here is you can see Akin Menges's uh, pavilion, which was a temporary installation where you could see robots building this pavilion in real time. 
So there's a new form of spatial activation in the sense that we're not just reliant on stage events or performances or music. We, we now have something else that's helping to activate public space. But the, the, the key point about this slide in this project is the fact that that central water feature can be drained away and it was designed, and that's a fundamental, is that it was designed to be drained away in order to create a stage. And that I think is something that we're seeing more and more in client briefs, developers, uh, city officials, local planning authorities, they're all understanding now that public spaces are contested spaces. They have to work much harder than just a fixed, uh, fixed space. So building in that flexibility is a, is a really strong way in which you can uh, bring different audiences, different publics into a space. Uh, and hopefully, overall, the aim is to get more diversity of different demographics, different age groups, different communities coming together. It also functions as a strong platform for the annual event, the uh, London Festival of Architecture. I think, sorry, London Design Festival, rather, I always get those too confused. London Design Week happens here and the VNA has been the headquarters of, uh, of that annual art program. So there's always this emerging and evolving quality of public art, both engaging with the water feature, but also drawing in new audiences that maybe haven't visited the space in a while. The last one in London I wanted to touch on was Pottersfield Park. So for those that are outside of London, this sits in the shadows of one of London's world heritage sites, which is Tower Bridge, which you can see in the background there. And the interesting thing about this project is it was set up as a trust. So all of the events that happen in the lawn space here raises money for two head gardeners to oversee the uh, management and maintenance of Pete Woldoff's garden, which is to the south of the site. <clears throat> So what you have is this really fascinating thing going on where the lawn is being used for corporate marketing events. And it's not just billboards saying this is our brand. There really is a strong ethos of putting something there that's going to engage with people. But it is ultimately a, a money-making machine that that's, uh, corporate entities want to use because you get the extraordinary backdrop of Tower Bridge. And it gives you that postcode post quality. But what it is doing is it's generating uh, the funds to look after this garden. So while the, that grass area is going through its own extraordinary change of color, of pace, of energy, there's also this softer activation going on in the gardens as Pete Woodoff is as a, in, the, in a similar way than to a stage in curated space. He's curated change through the plants that they will change and emerge and, and, and decay and die throughout the season. So for those of us that walk through this space on a day to day, uh, week to week basis. We see that change. We're constantly drawn into the space because something's changing. I hope everyone's with me. It's always interesting just talking to a screen. I don't know if anyone's still there, but hopefully you're still there with me. Um, the next thing that I found really interesting recently is what I call the rise of the installation culture. And this really has come about as a result, I would say largely from first the fourth plinth at Trafalgar Square and secondly, through the Serpentine Gallery uh, at Hyde Park Kensington Gardens. And also this project, which is the MoMA PS1. So every year there's a, a competition for an emerging architect to design an installation in this space that couples with a music uh, festival called the, the Mix Festival. So you have this combination of the cultural side of music, people coming because they want to engage with the music, but also the architecture, the fact that you can engage with this as, a, as an installed piece of architecture is really interesting. Same thing happens with the Serpentine. And what I love about the Serpentine, and, and those that, that live in London might also agree with this, is that yes, there's, a, there's an architectural moment where this, where this object lands, but for six months it becomes a destination where otherwise it's, it's relatively an, uh, an uninspiring piece of grass. And what happens around the periphery of that object, what happens with the readings, the constant presentations, the sharing of knowledge. That to me, I think is one of the more successful sides of, of uh, the Serpentine Pavilion. And that has started to spread. So this is the, the second year uh, installation at the Dulwich Picture Gallery. Again, it's, it's another example of the pavilion um, where you are introducing an object to generate perhaps new audiences, to draw new audiences down to, to, the, to the gallery or to the museum or to a different part of a, the city that they've not been to. And Rosie also mentioned the importance of the Anti Pavilion, also that um, the Architecture Foundation is engaged with. Again, another example of how engaging with the, the design culture, the creative culture that exists within a city, 
can create these moments of, of disruption, I would say with that one for sure, but also of, of intrigue and uh, pulling people to new parts of the city. So it's also not just about architecture. This is the street that every summer gets closed in Montreal and it's opened up to, a to the design community as a design competition. And what's happening in the public street as a direct synergy with the, uh, the events that are going on in the museum. So this had to do with, um, uh, with the mummies and the gold and the way in which gold was used in that exhibit. And it was then translated out into the public space. So streets, and we see this now, don't we, in, in light of COVID-19, is the reappropriation of streets as public space and how creativity can effectively be unleashed in, uh, in the street when the car is taken away and how much space we actually have. Another example is the Flatiron Competition in New York, which is a small triangular piece of land to the north of the Flatiron Building. And this is now in its sixth or seventh year. Again, they host the competition, a relatively modest budget and emerging architects, artists, uh, designers, industrial designers have a go at creating something. And this was uh, a really successful one in the sense that it was interactive. It was not just a fixed piece of public art. There was the ability to engage with it in the sense that it was uh, these hammocks, which you can imagine sitting in, in the shadows of the Empire State Building in the distance there. Another example of the street as, as public space is Robson Redou in Vancouver. What's interesting about this is it was, it came off the back of uh, Canada winning the Winter Olympics in ice hockey. And there was a huge celebration that happened on the street. And the planners that were responsible for, for looking after the public space called Viva Vancouver, saw this as a huge opportunity to begin to experiment to see if perhaps they could generate enough interest and momentum to close this street permanently uh, to create a public space. So they ran this competition for I think five cycles, five different installations and they achieved what they were trying to do. It was then closed off and became now a, a physical, permanent, uh, pedestrianized space where cars have been removed. And I'm gonna revisit this now uh, it, through some research to see if it still has that same sort of energy and anticipation that the temporary installations brought. Because there, I think that's something we also find with, with installations like the Serpentine Pavilion is that there's this, this anticipation that comes with those of us that live in London knowing that it's coming. There's a sense of, okay, it's coming into the summer, there's going to be a new installation. And I think that was a similar situation that we saw in Vancouver in the street. The other phenomenon we're seeing, or, or, or trend you might call it, is this idea of traveling installations again. So this is, a, this is called Impulse by Lateral Office. And originally it was designed for Place de Festival in, uh, in Montreal. It's since been, uh, it's since gone to Harvard. So this is historic Harvard Yard where these, uh, where the lateral um, offices installed Impulse. It's also been here in London on multiple occasions, most recently at Cold Drops Yard. And again, it shows the, the power and the, the quality of being able to interact with an object, interact with a temporary installation that's there for only a short moment of time too. The other thing I've noticed, and you maybe also have, have seen this recently, is this idea that program is becoming so strong, the primacy of program is so so evident now that it's beginning to shape the physical manifestation of design in the public spaces and parks that we design in. And that's probably a thing most evident uh, with the work of James Quarterfield operations here at Central Green Navy Yard, where each of these nested rings is really driven, the shape of it, the diameter of it is driven by a specific use. So you can see Bocce, Patonk in the center, you can see the fitness station, amphitheater, hammock groves, and that's all held together by what they call the social track. And you can also see the picnic table in the end. So each of these very specific uses is beginning to determine the layout, the organization of a space. So this was a really fun one to begin to explore in 3D, understanding how it sits within the context, then expanding and exploding the different individual elements that make up that space. How big are they? What are their uses? How do people engage with those individual rooms? Another example of how uses are, are beginning to shape space is the Goods Line in Sydney. Now this is a much different organization pattern than Central Green. It's a long linear space uh, following in, in, uh, in line with the High Line in New York. It's a, an elevated viaduct. But it's a similar premise where you have 
an organizational structure in this sense, moving from A to B. And off of that structure, you have a series of these rooms. You can see the fitness station on the left, see table tennis, uh, children's play area, flexible lawn spaces, and then also the ability to host outdoor cinema, which is again, one of those go-to ubiquitous activators that we see deployed in pretty much every city now. Um, so that's something we need to discuss at the end. It's how do we create really distinct and uh, site-specific installations. Reconfigured space. Now, this is one I, I hope that we're moving towards because it goes back to what some of the studies that William H. White discovered where when we have some ownership of a site, we really find it more interesting. We want to dwell in those spaces longer. So reconfigured space is really this idea that, we, that a space can be powered by the participants is the way I like to phrase it. So this, the first one is a project by Interborough Partners in New York. And it's a fascinating one where you're exploring the idea of the urban void. The notion that this is kind of a disruption in the continuum of capital. It's a place that is almost formless, has no identity, yet the urban void looks the same pretty much anywhere in the world. And there's a great book that I must reference now called uh, The Glossary of Urban Voids by Sergio Lopez Pinheiro, which I've just recently finished reading. So it's a fascinating collection of phrases that have been used to try to characterize and define the spaces that we're looking at here in front of us. But what Interboro did is they, they introduced, what's interesting is on this edge, this, this flexible, movable spine, which you could close off to define the space or you could open it up to increase the permeability but also to change the way in which you as the, the person sitting in the space might want to interact with the space. If you wanna sit looking to the sun, you can spin this table around and look to the sun. If you wanna be in the shade, if you wanna have a conversation with your friends. So it's a, it's a, it's a really powerful and, and subtle way of bringing movement and animation and flexibility where we can control that space in a, in a really interesting way. Another example that you may have seen is pop-up furniture by Carmelo Bogman and uh, Roger Martens. And this, this is a great one of, of transforming what is effectively a transit movement space going from A to B. This, is, this could be the corner of any street anywhere in the world that we just pass by without it really paying any attention. But through this introduction of a really playful hydraulic, hydraulic seat and, and table, it transforms that into something where people stop, have a conversation, and it also has that, that element of kind of the wow factor of that element of surprise. And you can imagine this was a, a strong social media uh, movement when it first came out. One artist that I've really been following recently uh, and is also featured in the book is, is Matthew Mazzotta. And he's an artist that operates somewhere between the performative and the object. The notion that you create a piece of public art that sits static, that people can engage with and, and take appreciation with. At the same moment, it can be unrolled, deployed, reconfigured in a way that allows people to interact with it. And, and uh, you can see it particularly here with open house on the bottom and storefront theater at the top. Storefront theater is in downtown Nebraska. And so th this, there's a series of shops that were going into decline. They converted one of those storefronts into an amphitheater or a tiered seating thing. And an amazing moment when the, the cinema screen is brought up by tractor and everyone comes together around the movie. So his work I think is really interesting about how we can begin to see the insertion of objects like a piece of public art or an installation as being an opportunity to uh, engage people in a way that it can be uh, reconfigured so that people can occupy it. The image on the bottom, I had an animation, I've taken it out, but it's a, it's a project by OMA by Shohei Shigematsu in the uh, New York office of OMA. And this is probably the most dramatic and expensive, I would say, uh, method of reconfiguring space. So this is one of the main boardrooms. So you can see how um, it's used as a, as a student amphitheater. You can see where the students would sit. You, could, you can imagine a lecture going on. But also it's used as the boardroom. So these big boardroom chairs are rolled out when they're having a board meeting. And when it needs to convert back to it being the student forum, then those, those huge board meeting room chairs are in kind of a complex orchestration are folded into the ground through mechanized means. So those are three examples I think that demonstrate the reconfiguration of spaces. Um, this is a, a project that was experimented with at the Matisse Garden Festival. I'll just put this slide real quick in fact I already have it open. And you know this oh, it's not gonna work. 
um, technical failure. Effectively, what this was showing is these trees being slid on underground rails. And it was, it was obviously raising more questions than answers, but it does raise some interesting conversations around how we can begin to think about even things like shade, movable shade. We've seen recently probably the, the trees that are on wheels that you can move around and begin to organize in a different way. And perhaps most, uh, most significantly, and as a serious built project and, and investment in the city in New York, just off the high line is Dillard's uh The Shed. And this, was, this is really a great lesson in multiplied ground where you have an open air public space, which we can see in any city, flat, uh, flexible, the ability to host any kind of events. But also with that, you have the ability to slide out this extraordinary canopy, deploy it from the building, detach it from that building. And within that canopy, you have all the inbuilt infrastructure that you need to have a stage set, lighting, sound, fixings, etc. So suddenly you have this extraordinary internal cathedral-like space that allows you to host events no matter what the weather is, etc. So how are we for time, Rosie? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, we're good, we're good, yeah. We're okay. We're okay, so I've got a few more case studies we might go through if everyone's still up for it and still engaged. But I came across this quote recently reading um, the Downsview case, uh, Downsview case competition by Julia Serzniak. And within that, within that book, and it's, it was a great moment where the design industry really began to think about using time and the notion of time in design and how we could begin to think about that both ecologically through planting and horticulture, but also with the ways in which the community can be engaged over time culturally. And this quote really stuck with me. Uh, and it's, I think it's something that we all need to focus on as we design urban public spaces. So instead of flexibility, thus we might now think more precisely in terms of scales of undecidability. By this, I mean the landscape's capacity for precision of form, notwithstanding flexibility of program for the precisely open rather than the vaguely loose. And I think it's that term which I've underlined is really important now because we're all, we're all being encouraged or asked by clients to design open flexible spaces where uh, they can put different installations and things in. And we've never really been taught how to do that. We've never really been taught to scale a space. How big a space do you need to have a good outdoor cinema? Or how big a space needs to be just big enough that it has enough flexibility but doesn't feel too big. So I think there's a real call, call to arms in this quote for the precisely open to study, to uh, interrogate, to agonize over the scale of, of a space before we begin to design what its uses might be. She goes on to say, through this framework, we are able to reject the notion that landscapes are either naturalistic and formless or object-like and formful. And I read that really as object-like and formful as just a space that has every kind of activator you can imagine. Table tennis tables, uh, food trucks, outdoor cinemas, outdoor gyms, uh, ice skating rinks, all those go-to things that we're using now in the public realm. And it's, she's really challenged us to think very hard and very carefully about how we can design that. So I just wanted to go a bit more now and share a little bit more about the structure of the book for those of you that maybe have had a chance to look at it or, 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 or are interested uh, after hearing some of the discussion here. So within it, there's 28 case studies and the intent here really was to create a manual that you could go back to and revisit as you were wrestling with your own design decisions and uh, aspirations in your day-to-day -day work. And the aim was really to try to find different projects in different contexts different urban surroundings, uh, different parts of the world, different climates, et cetera, and across different scales. So as I said, there's 28 of those and it's organized so you can come and find and reference each of the individual projects and, and really dissect that particular project. Also within it are a series of theoretical essays by uh, leading academics, some that, that straddle both academia and practice. Uh, Chris Reed, for instance, heads up Stoss, and I'll come to talk about one of his projects. Um, Christopher Wengro, again, he's, <clears throat> he's actually more of a curator, so it's really interesting reading that essay to understand people that rece are recipients of the spaces that we design, how do they begin to think about overlaying those activities and installations on top of them? 
Also within it are a couple of uh, practice essays by practitioners and how they're approaching the design and activation of public space in their everyday design work. So again, some really powerful players in the, in the design world here, um, Field Operations, West 8, Gauss Lestage, Ken Chu, who was behind all of the work that's happened uh, at King's Cross, he's a landscape architect, but was behind that as a, as a client. And Gina Ford, who's very active in the States also. And lastly, James Coyle has written The Afterword, which is an amazing read. It's a great summary and uh, encapsulation of all the ideas in the book. So what I thought I'd do, last couple of slides here, is take you through a couple of case studies to understand, I think, some of the two really strong examples of, of this. <clears throat> The first is the lawn on D in Boston. And this, this is what they called a, an, an eyes wide open experiment. It was a holding space for the convention center. They weren't quite sure what to do with the space. So they commissioned Sasaki to come up with, to come up with a design using effectively in the bottom diagram there, a series of open flat lawn spaces, which they framed with some topography. They brought in uh, a marquee that acts as a temporary food hub and a destination. Importantly, one of the key things here is they were able to get a liquor license too. And that meant in America, that's, it's a rare thing to be able to be outdoors with alcohol. So that meant that they could really allow people to stay, feel comfortable, feel the ability to be in this public space for a while. And then within that space, and this was a fascinating part of the research of the book, was really deconstructing not just the spatial organization of these case studies, but also the quantum, the variety, the scale of different um, softer infrastructure or overlay elements that are in the public space, anything from deck chairs to, uh, to cornhole to barbecue stations, etc. And one of the key ones is this one down at the bottom called Swing Time that was designed by Howler Yoon in, in the States. And what's interesting, I think, and important for us and a lesson for us is the importance of investing in a set piece, a really strong installation that's going to really be the linchpin of the whole space. And this has become so successful that people are traveling from all over Massachusetts to come and, and be on these swings. And it's driven, it really is driven by social media. It's now become the selfie capital of Boston. People want to, want to be seen in these swings. They want to be been seen in this, in a fairly trendy and uh, an interesting space to be in. It also then hosts larger, more dynamic installations that Christopher Wengro was behind as far as what he was curating. And importantly, he was really reaching into the community to find local arts groups that were already doing really good things that he could partner with. Uh, the last case study I wanted to show is uh, the Plaza at Harvard University. And this project really began with this fairly bold and brave move by Harvard University to bring out these colorful chairs. Now, for most of us, it might just look like they've rolled out a couple of movable uh, individual seats. But this is this is historic Harvard Yard. This is a place that people will go to from all over the world. They want to come and experience this historic part of the campus. But what the planners within the campus recognize is that there was no place or no reason for people to stop, to appreciate the buildings, to appreciate the surroundings. It's effectively just an open grass area with a series of crisscross paths. And bringing these chairs in suddenly transformed this as a place of movement and transit into a place of dwelling, a place of, of quiet, a place of relaxation, but also a place to come together uh, to study, to hang out with your friends, etc. And what that did is it prompted the campus to set up something called Harvard Common Spaces. And it's a, it's a team of three or four people that are dedicated now to thinking about how every space in the campus can be brought to life, programmed, activated, uh, enlivened throughout the year. And these images that you see on the screen here were actually some early testing overlays that Chris Reed and his team at Stoss uh, in Boston did before they even made any, any design decisions. They were really trying to tease out what people might do in the space. So they brought out food trucks, tables and chairs. This image here in the bottom, they're actually testing a mock-up of the permanent benches that they, that they put in the space. They brought in the ice skating rinks and uh, live music in a huge tent. And they also, building off the work of William H. White, they began to come up with this notational diagram about the different, if you were to overlay the different uses, the times, the rhythms, the cadence of this space, those moments when people are idle in the space, 
when the food trucks are out, when, the, when these big marquees might be out. It begins to create this quite interesting imbricated, enmeshed uh, diagram of the different uses and people that are in the space. And I then took this diagram and tried to decode it a bit by introducing, so those diagrams that are hung off the bottom are the key moments in the life of this space when the tents come out or the winter overlays with ice skating happens and curling, but also the idea of the food trucks that come every day, and then also a traditional farmer's market that happens in the space. So it sets up quite an interesting rhythm about what's going on. So I'll just, we see this more and more also. I think this is a fascinating uh, time that we're living in as far as design goes, where we, we design this space and we get the chance to really begin to think about what the life of it's gonna be. How are people gonna utilize this space? How are they gonna organize? How are they gonna gather in certain areas? So this is Chris and his team beginning to conceptualize and present back to the client really, the flexibility the programmability uh, of this space, the open-endedness of it, that <clears throat> none of these really require any fixed configuration. A lot of them are just bringing in a temporary stage and allowing people to show up. But they did also think about more of the permanent infrastructure. So underneath this large canopy at the bottom, this marquee, that's brought out twice a year to do with graduation and things, and built into the paving are anchor points to receive that tent. So there were a couple of fixed programs that they knew were going to be taking place that they had to account for. This winter overlay <clears throat> now happens every year. The farmer's market again happens uh, every week. And then at night, and oftentimes in its resting state, it's cleared out. The edges are still really activated. And along here, I don't know if you can see in this image, but there's a series of really beautifully crafted 3D designed benches that, uh, that really hold the space. And what I find interesting is they have a sculptural quality to them. So if they're not used as benches, they still look like a piece of public art. And again, just trying to, trying to decode that space and understand all the different elements that, are, that really make up the, the social side of the space. And a few images taken. So the images on the right are taken at the same place. And that's, the, that's a key uh, signature of the book is I've, I've really been uh, inspired to revisit these places to see how it changes and emerges. So I've, uh, a lot of the case studies have images set up in the exact same location so you can really see how the, the same space changes over time. And then the winter, I think winter is a <clears throat> quite an interesting thing to begin to think about designing for. In Boston the winters are really dramatic so they need to think about how they can deal with snow removal but still provide spaces for people to engage with. And that's a, a really strong overview shot of, of the plaza with the so in this image, you're seeing the, the farmer's market deployed. You see the food trucks that come on the left-hand side of the image every day. They're charged $50 a day. <clears throat> the, um, the farmer's market is free for people that are setting up their stalls. So the only money that they're really making is, is through the food trucks, and that's really to cover maintenance costs and cleaning, et cetera. But uh, I think this is a really strong example of where program and activation and the cultural side of the space is foregrounded in the design process. And that is my last slide. And again, please feel free to join along in any social media that you're on if you're interested. Thank you so much, Canon. Um, thank you, that was fascinating. Um, if you have questions for Canon, please put them in the chat. I can see we already have one coming in, um, um, which is, yeah, it's, it's about the kind of topic which I think that you thought might arise about um, privatised public space. Mm. Um, I guess like we've seen that the the importance of um, having public space through like having spaces to protest in the past few months um, um, kind of these places where these installations um, I thought it was interesting when you spoke about kind of the street as a public space um, you've seen children uh, like um, making chalkboard, making chalk, uh, like drawings on the, on the streets when yeah. the cars um, were off the road. Um, we've seen like the Black Lives Matter um, painting on the, on the road up to Washington. Um, and then just today I saw that um, someone has been, a woman like defaced the, um, the road markings mm. and kind of tension um, between different, um, groups is kind of playing out in real time in um, public space. Um, 
maybe I can go to Catherine's question. I'm going to unmute you, Catherine. Yeah. Oh, hello. Um, yeah, um, I mean, we're seeing places now representing, or you could say masquerading as, as public spaces. And it's, there isn't a designated line that one passes. It's not like um, Somerset House, where you know you're going into a gallery space itself. And I just really wonder about, you know, how that's being represented as well as how it's being um, the security of that, those kinds of places is being managed. And um, the questions about, as I say, about people who can be excluded from those kinds of spaces. I mean, have you considered that in your, in your book at all in terms of ownership? Yes, uh, and Adrian, who's from West State, really talks about particularly surveillance, and his, his essay is fascinating. I would definitely encourage you to find a way to read that because it's um one. He's a very provocative writer, but he really goes into what what are what are we living now in a surveilled state? I mean, the thing around for me, because this is often a conversation that happens as a result when you start to talk about activated spaces, because oftentimes they are done in privately owned public spaces because they are driven by developers that are really pushing football. They're really interested in getting different demographics, different people to come into spaces. And I suppose ultimately, and it's, it's kind of the Marmite question, some people really feel that they're overly surveilled, overly secured in privately owned public spaces. Things like King's Cross, which is often used as, as the case study here, the thing about it, and I heard, uh, I heard Peter Bishop, who was the head of planning at Camden when King's Cross was, was being developed, is he said, as a local planning authority, they wouldn't be able to curate and program King's Cross the way that Argent has. They're just not skilled up to do it. They don't have the resources to do it. So that's one side of it, is the idea of management and governance. The other is the practicalities of funding it. And I think ultimately what it comes down to is, is what you can't do in a public in a privately owned public space. And usually that, that distills down to, you can't skateboard, you can't protest. And I, I read a really interesting description of what genuine public open space is by, uh, it's a quote by Don Mitchell. And he says, genuine open space is one that allows for struggle and contest. And we know that we can't do that in privately owned public spaces. The flip side of that, that I've heard also argued and, and discussed is that a lot of people do feel tremendously safe in a privately owned public space because it's clean, it's managed, uh, it does feel that you can be there as a member of the public. I think people in Granary Square that are coming and setting up there, well, this is all nostalgic now because you can't really go in the fountains, but when, when the fountains were there and we could be in public space, people would sit and occupy Granary Square for the whole day. And I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult one to say that those people didn't feel that they were in a, in a public space because I, I think they probably felt that, they feel safe. So the, the question I think around privately owned public spaces is really down to those, those activities that we can't do. And I think that's really, really comes into focus in light of what's happening with the Black, Black Lives Matter movement that's moving across the world. That in a, in a place like Granary Square, you wouldn't be able to, to make your voice heard or you wouldn't be able to gather in a group and be able to uh, to protest for democracy. So those are the those are the points of contestation that I don't think we we have found any resolution to, but it certainly is a reality uh, in cities like London that there are these hosts of privately owned public spaces that are doing great things for the city, but they're also the, the darker side of surveillance, of data collection, of all those things that we probably don't know enough about really. If that went some distance to answering your question. Um, Catherine, did you want to come back on that or should I move to Nick? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess it's just what um, can be excluded also in the future. Um, because, I mean, so far those spaces um, are functioning. They're, you know, and profit is being made. Uh, Argent has huge investors at King's Cross that are related to pension funds. So, you know, there's, um, there's desire for those to be ongoing and active from a, a, a profit um, basis. However, there is that issue whereby 
if profit is no longer made, then those spaces could be vacated. And all of those spaces could, because they're not being owned or managed by, you could say state or being public, then they can actually be transformed completely in the future. And also the fact that no matter what, they really are spaces for consumption. That is the underlying aspect to them. And I think that's, that's also difficult to avoid. They are. I think they, there is a commercialization of public space conversation to have. But equally and arguably, you can go to Granary Square and not buy anything. So you can, you can do it if, if you so wish. It's not mandatory, it's not obligatory that you buy a coffee. Or, or, uh, or even when you go down to Cold Drop Yard, I, that's, that I think has been quite interesting. Cold Drop Yard has been the first manifestation at King's Cross where I've really felt out of place in a way. It, it does very much feel that it's designed for a particular demographic. Even, you know, I'm a white middle class male and I still feel that, okay, this is, this is exclusive even for me. And so it's interesting, I think, what's going on in that space particularly. And I think really that's largely down to what's going on inside the buildings, what's going on inside the frontages. That if there were different shops perhaps in there or different uses, then I think the use of the space and your overall feeling and atmosphere would feel different too. So it's, a, it's an amazing example of the reciprocity between the internal function of a building and the external place that really comes together to, to make a, a place feel like a place. You can say that. Um, I'm just going to move to um, Nick Walker. Hi there. Um, Thanks for a great talk, Canon, and look forward to buying your book. Um, I suppose my question carries on from Catherine and um, a, a book by um, Anna Winton, Ground Control, which talks about the privatization of public space. He gives specific examples like places such as um, Liverpool One, where elderly people are actively moved on because it, they're bringing down the tone of the place. Um, but my question is more about um, the nature of the urban spaces and this idea that they're becoming more uh, about an experience rather than a public space. And I was watching a program last night about um, Keith Haring and New York in the 1970s and just seeing, you know, the incredible despair in that city at the time, but how much vibrancy it brought to the city because there were so many opportunities for art and installation and un regulated interventions. So I, I suppose what happens in our cities is that we find spaces that have suffered from decay or have been misused, you know, used for cars or storage. Um, that offers up, um, affords opportunities for artists and unregulated uh, artwork. Uh, inevitably, those spaces then become discovered by speculators. They become gentrified and privatized. And um, once that happens, they lose their original edge and that that atmosphere and that vitality is gone. And on top of that, sort of picking up on, on Catherine again and just, you know, that careful balance between um, public and private. It is that sort of notion that we are filtering people out, you know, that there are places that are designed to keep certain socioeconomic groups away. Um, and, you know, one, one personal experience, is I remember going to uh, I live in Scotland, but I was down in, in London and visiting the Serpentine Gallery when it was, or the, um, the installation when it was Zumta, and being sort of um, pushed out because there was going to be a private event on, so the mm. public were sort of, you know, scooted out of the way. So how do you balance that, and, and, and what are your feelings on privatisation of um, public space, and how, where it comes from? Yeah, well, I think what you described there is... I think that this idea of the urban void is something I'm intrigued, really intrigued by. And I'm actually going to run a studio next term at the Bartlett's on, on the idea of the urban void. Because uh, I do, you're absolutely right, you need spaces like that, that have kind of an open-ended, indeterminate quality, not just in its spatial arrangement and configuration, but in its management condition or its operation side, that it doesn't really belong to anyone, but at the same time belongs to everyone. We need those spaces. The, the challenge, as you've just described very eloquently, is how do you how do you maintain those qualities? So you have an urban void. It gets identified by developers. Uh, Pop Brixton is a great example. There's an urban void. They brought Carl Turner in. They built Pop Brixton. 
Pop Brixton is now so successful and so popular that uh, it's a destination in its own right. But at some point, that, that whole movement is going to have to go away. So Pop Brixton will get dissolved and, and a set of flats will go in. So I've, I've really been following what you and I have been doing. I've been looking at this idea of from meanwhile to worthwhile. And I think it's a really powerful stream of, of, uh, of experimentation, I suppose, for developers to begin to think about how can they take something like Pop Brixton that was a void, it was an urban void, had no real uh, identity to it, it was ubiquitous, could be anywhere in the world. They created something with Pop Brixton but now it risks being lost. How do you take what you've managed to build up and integrate that into the final scheme that you're trying to, you know, your developer, you're trying to turn a profit. How can you do that, but not lose those, those elusive qualities that they managed to capture? So I, I definitely think there's a whole huge amount of work to go into experimenting and researching how that could happen. But also how do you create, how do you create other voids in a city? Because oftentimes an open urban void area is fenced off because someone owns it. Someone usually owns that land and they're just waiting for prime time in the market to develop. But how could you actually uh, treat it as a meanwhile use? I know that Will Sandy's on here. He's, he's done a few of these. Uh, he's a bit of an expert at this. But I do think there's something about um, just allowing, somehow allowing access in there, giving enough of an infrastructure to prompt some sort of reappropriation of those spaces but then also there's a flip side that thing you know things that are that are not necessarily conducive to a healthy city will happen there and then what do you do <laughs> so that's the great dream but i would definitely i'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give sergio a plug here i hope you guys can see that i would definitely check this book out it's called the glossary of urban voids and uh he's basically he's basically gone through and amalgamated all the different descriptions of of the urban void uh, how do you classify it? How do you even begin to describe it? Uh, and then what do you, how do you leave it as an indeterminate, marginalized uh, disruption in the continuum of capital? I love that. You know, that's decided that there's a break in the flow of money through a city when you have an urban void. And then how do you allow the public to own that space? All great questions. And I don't, I don't know the answers to the, to the privately owned public space question. What I will say is that it's definitely discussed uh, and explored through various essays in the book. So, I, I suppose by writers that are that are far better than me too. I suppose it's the homogenization of these spaces as yeah. well. You know that you get a space in uh, Glasgow that ends up looking like a space in Newcastle, um, yeah. and that's because it's financed by you know big uh, pension companies who don't really understand the context or um, locality. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. And that, that also happened at the Lawn on D, that case study I showed you, where originally it was something really edgy, really interesting, tons of great installations by emerging artists. And then it became popular, and then the banks basically now own it, and it's called, I think it's called Powered by, powered by one of the main banks there now. So, and it, it's closed off now to private events too. So it is that continuum of developing something that's really interesting and then having it tip over into it becoming a, a commodity that you can make some profit off of. And that's, that's that fine tipping point that if we can really recalibrate so it always stays as an interesting public space, then we'll, we'll be doing something good. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Nair. Yeah, really great questions and thoughts. Um, we've just got one, um, I think we've just got time for one final question um, from Lucy M. And I'm muted to you. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, I was really curious to ask about um, co-design and whether that had featured at all in some of the case studies that you had looked at, whether that's through the input of stakeholder groups, stakeholders who may have some kind of investment or leverage, or it could be just the, the general public. Um, I've <clears throat> worked on projects in Latin America where that's been quite a big feature, and um, I've not seen it so strongly used in UK projects around tactical urbanism or, or urban, urban installations. So I'm really curious about your view on how it works in what you've seen, if, if it's used. Yeah, yeah that's, it's a great question. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say there's many case studies in the book that, that have looked at that in any great detail because oftentimes those are, they're a bit more scrappy there. 
bottom-up planning and design, whereas a lot of the projects in, in, in this book are really um, projects that have come from, from the particular organization and implemented by, by a designer. The one I would say that perhaps does touch it is the lawn, in fact, those two case studies I showed at the end, the lawn on D and uh, Arbor Plaza, mostly because there was a degree of, of testing and experimentation. There wasn't necessarily a fixed design from, in fact, at any stage uh, until they really had a clear sense about what the demands were or how people wanted to use that space, what they might engage with in that space. So the lawn on D, for instance, you know, it's, it's still, evolving as a as a place of of co-design and the co-designers are are hopefully now a lot more local artists that have seen what's come before it that you have the framework and the structure of the space it's now hopefully become a canvas for them to experiment with different different media in that area they also do kind of open-ended uh days of like art days that just roll out huge circular patterns of paper and the community come and and uh, take ownership of that, but it's in a, it is in an organized and more formalized way, but there is a degree of, I would say, uh, evolutionary co-design there. As a, it wasn't co-designed by a series of designers and then implemented, but it's being co-designed with, with an ongoing community involvement. I would say that the Harvard Plaza, in a way, yes, were probably co-designed, and in fact, it really is still being co-designed because part of the remit of Harvard Common Spaces is to engage both with uh, the local art groups that are on the campus, but also with students directly. So if there's, there's ways in which the students can get in touch and perform in the space, if, they're, if they want to do music, if they want to do dance, they can organize protests too. So it's, it's a form of organized democracy in that sense. You can, uh, they're still somewhat regulated, but it is open. It is open to, to protests and open to, uh, to marches and movements. So no doubt Black Lives Matter has really had a presence at Harvard Plaza, which is you know, so critical and so important for our spaces to fulfill that role. 